in a very similar field. I take him as a serial entrepreneur with a very strong expertise in a certain domain, which is retail, e-commerce, um, online marketplaces. And I actually also got to know him because I wanted him to be a mentor for our accelerator. So please, um, Sven, Rito, uh, welcome um, here to WeWork. Welcome to Startup Prime. So, and the same was years later when we did an IPO of the company, 
um, and, and I, I stepped down from Z plus. My wife said, okay, second child on the way, what kind of job are you getting? And I said, no, I'm not getting a job, I'm starting a new company. So, and, and this is what, what I think um, is a bit like genetic, that you say, you look at things more from the opportunity side rather than the risk side. And this is where I'm a bit gifted and lucky that I, I don't have that, you know, that, that, that I don't feel the pressure in that sense. And, and, and then I got lucky at, 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 uh, with this new plus thing. Actually, um, um, one of our, my co-founders, um, he was, um, actually I met him at Fribourg. He went to Oxford and then he gathered a team. And I was fed up at Wallenberger because I was 11 months at Fisman. And I felt like, okay, let's, what's the next step? And then he came along, so I just jumped on the boat and then we worked So it's, it's about taking, taking the risk at the right time for the opportunities. Why then the career at Roland Do you think like having kind of a, a professional background, so starting off with kind of a very normal job helps to become acquainted with entrepreneurship? Yeah, well, in, in my head, I, 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 I wanted to be an investment banker, but everybody turned me down. So uh, and then I ended up becoming a management consultant. Uh, lucky for me, because um, we, I really learned also to work very hard, but also to, to use be very strong on the operational number side. And and, um, and actually there I met the still running CEO of Zooplus, uh, my project team leader, Cornelius, who is still running the company, and I'm very happy and grateful that he's still doing it. Uh, one of the main reasons why I'm still a shareholder at Zooplus is that he's still running the company. Okay, but would you recommend to kind of first time entrepreneurs who go first into I've seen, I've seen both ways actually uh, succeed, uh, but as long as you don't have a, a, a perfect idea and a perfect setup, I say why not start work for other people and, and actually you know, get some experiences and actually learn how to work, uh, get efficient, um, learn to how to actually apply tools like actually we were running databases for the clients which we then applied as a plus. So big data now was already big data then, so we actually could, could uh, pin down the contribution model free on the flavor of cat food uh, after the six month time. So in back in 1999. So and, and this was just because we, we just did it the way at Golden Burger. So I think there's always uh, some value from, from actually starting off at a, at a different place. But I don't think it's as necessary either. In, in our case, we had one guy on board who had no work experience at all, and he left after one year because he was he was too far away from the rest of the team. So that's also a situation which can occur. Mm -hmm. So, Roland Berger helped you to kind of get certain basics in place. Um, and then I think people are interested into this moment where um, you have to jump or you decide to jump. And you mentioned just earlier um, you had the perfect idea, the perfect setup maybe the perfect funding team, how do you recognize this type of moments and when you decide, okay, this is the time, let's try Yeah, when, when I look at my life, it's like every, every big decision was more based on gut feeling than on really an analysis. And, 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 and then com combined with market opportunity, I think. And back in 1999, it was like super crazy time. I was like, like stock markets were skyrocketing, money was pouring into the markets, and you felt like, okay, I, mean, I cannot stay on the ground. Like all the all the elevators went up, and, and then we just and we had one role model in, in the United States with Pants.com. Actually, they failed where where Zoomplus succeeded, and then and, uh, and then that was market opportunity. And then you, you just I mean I think you just take one step at a time. You just gather a team, you build a business plan. Through that, you realize, okay, we need one guy covering logistics. Okay, and I just said, like, was, I mean, he was married to kids. And I was like, he never gonna do it. Okay, and he said, like, yeah, well, let me think about it. And then actually, he, he just came on board, and so we like, okay, covered. And then um, we ramped up logistics in within 60 days, and uh, web shop next day. So, and then we started speaking to investors, and we had a very cool um, uh, angel round, uh, and, and you get so much positive feedback. And people say, like, okay, yeah, cool, let's. Do do this. Everybody was so so hyped up. Of course, there was greed in the room. Everybody was like, "Yeah, I want to make I can do the real rich quick." Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the drivers, of course. And, and you know, one one thing leads to 
another, and then you start actually have the funding now, and then you have a very significant Series A, I think 40 million Deutsche Mark, 7 million euros. By the time I was with that, was really a lot of money. And uh, <laughs> then you start squandering the money because everybody tells you, yeah, you raise the money when you need it, get an MD in France, you know, build up here and then, and then you have to scale back again. So it's, it's, it's up and down. It's a roller coaster. Like, you mentioned that you were still kind of quite structured in the approach of finding the right team members, right? So I've interviewed quite a few of winners by now, and um, a lot of them are ex management consultants, and some of them just went through, I don't know, 100 business cases to figure out what is the idea that they really want to build up. But for you, the idea was pretty clear. You just needed to build a team around the idea, and then you jumped. Is that right? Yeah, well, the, the official version, I think, is when Florian, our former CFO, was always like, yeah, we scanned all the consumer markets, but, but that's just a blatant slide. So we just, that was just a pet surprise, and, and there was no need, because we knew that in Berlin was the My Toys team on the way, um, inspired by E Toys. I'm sorry, you're sitting in my back.
Say again. What were you responsible for? Oh yeah, um, I was uh, responsible. For, I was the first CFO actually. Uh, I don't know why, because Florian knew things from JP Morgan, but I, I, I put, put together the first business plan. After the funding round, the guys with me on the side said, "It's like one day uh, in uh, I don't know 2008, your business plan don't add up. So maybe you want to change that." So uh, then I took over marketing, and uh, then uh, actually I ended up doing operations. Um, which I'm not too bad at, but I don't really like it uh, to do it. Uh, but you did it for seven years? Before. Yeah, I did it for a long time. I mean, just did all the, the, the staff ramp up and, uh, and whatever, logistics and, and stuff, so, and customer service thing. So, so you started from a very small company, 4500, um, and you scaled up to, to the company which is now a couple of hundred? 500. Well, you don't count the, uh, the service partners, so it's I think five hundred. How do you like since you were actually responsible for talent uh, acquisition, so HR? Uh, how do you actually structure an organization for this to scale? Like, what type? What do you start actually putting in the processes, standardizing the the framework so that it, it kind of scale? It has yeah. the ability to scale. We started that in, in two ways. One was was very successful. The first one. We, um, we started to hire senior people after one year, also from Lord Burger and then from outside people from the tech department. And that was actually a different because I guess with other money you cannot hire Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and Leah is still on board, uh, also um, running marketing and sales. And, uh, and the second way was not very successful, we did that with Headhunters, and because the money was there, and that was really shit. And, and we had to scale back again, but. Um, the, 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 I don't know if you ever ramped up a company from 0 to 50 to 100 to 200. Um, it's always very painful because you uh, you have to you have people in the workforce who cannot make it. But of course you're loyal to these people because they brought you where you were currently at. And then you bring in new people who have to take a work responsibility and tell these people to step down or to step aside. So you're saying that certain people are made for certain places? I think, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a very slow learner, but uh, I like to learn, and then I know where my where I'm going to set. So I, I, yeah, I think everybody has a certain glass ceiling, and also an expertise where you are more like the expert or the manager. So you have to find out. And uh, and there, are, I think we talked before about that. Um, maybe one one goal of mine I can share is that um, I try to um, objectify. Um, I think that's the right word. Yeah. Uh, to the, how you make decisions of hiring the, people, the person you want, and um, and uh, in the VC world, everybody tells you, yeah, have a great team, and then you challenge and say, well, why is the team great? And that's like, yeah, no, we had a great talk. Yeah. So, and this is what I try to actually do with analytics, and I, I found several tools which you can actually apply during the recruiting process, and I work with a tool called Predictive Index. Um, so it's very, very easy to use in preparation for your interviews. Uh, you actually can say, okay, hey, you're a great candidate. Uh, we'd like to, uh, to, to fill out this form. Uh, and, uh, and then we just disclose what we learned about you. Uh, and, and, and it's about finding the right spot for this person. Because um, if you hire, for instance, um, an accountant, um, you need a safe pair of hands. Um, it's a completely different profile to a sales guy. Um, the same uh, analogy um, you just can take until you, you have a whatever, you need a brain surgery, and then you, you, you don't want to have a salesperson, even though he's a very outgoing guy, you know, uh, cutting around in, in your brain. So it's the same, the same like, it's not about like, you being good or bad, but you being right in the position you are you, recruited for. And this is very helpful. And I, I work with this ever since, even when I, um, I, I mean, do a little bit of investing on the side, but sometimes I try to look at what kind of team sits in front of me, how is the, the team. And do you have enough data to prove that this objectivization is working? Yeah, okay, that's, I mean, anecdotal, I mean, it's not like from my statistics, but uh, each time I, I, I voted against what the, the tool was telling me because I threw in my nerves because I was looking for someone six months in the, in the, in the process and then okay, let's say Peter. And then six months later he just had the same situation because Peter was not he was a great, great guy, but he was not the great guy for, for what I was actually uh, recruiting for. So yeah there is uh, lots of evidence. Funny enough I, I know people who use this um, these these tools for instance in um, this 
restructuring cases, they don't look at the numbers, they look at the management team and say, and you can see, okay, CEO doesn't get shit anything, the CFO is not interested in accuracy, and then you just see where the problems are, and then you just dig in and say, like, okay, let's look at logistics, let's look at finance department. So it's also a possible shortcut. Another way. So you managed to basically scale the, the, the company um, in 30 countries? We have compared to Amazon since we started the business. So this has, doesn't, it cannot 
scare you. I mean, this, I think we later on talk about uh, what I'm doing right now. We have this little pizza pretzels show in Berlin uh, every summer with 3,000 participants coming from retail and e-commerce backgrounds from K5. And this is what we actually show that there is, despite the fact that Amazon is huge, and I'm an Amazon uh, share owner myself, uh, huge, great companies actually thrive either against or with or at the side of Amazon. So I think there is still room to actually create cool stuff. I mean, the guys up there with the, with the super cool Anfliege, they just say they want to sell on Amazon. So, you know, why not? I mean, why not use the, the, the creative which is there? Because I was like the like CEO and I had a team, 
very dysfunctional team again. <laughs> um, so I could apply all my learnings and uh, gain trust and, and these things I'm apparently not uh, too bad at. And then we had a set up with, um, uh, with the production in Slovakia. So it was also very interesting that we had different cultures and so it was very challenging. Financially it was, it was okay, but uh, for me personally I, I learned a lot of that uh, and I grew a lot. Actually, during that time, I, I read the, uh, the yearly chapter for the Entrepreneurs' Organization for three years, uh, which was also very uh, interesting to, on a, you know, like, on a, so like or yeah, and, and actually to be responsible for like 70 entrepreneurs, female and male, to, like, that was also very fun. Yeah. Um, so this, so knowledge, because I guess that you get further and further into what you made, which is Um, how, how dif different the business model should later was from, from two plus? I mean, we're talking about there's no question of logistics or much less than for two plus? Yeah, I mean, the beauty is that you just have plain shirts and then you just get the order and you print it. So you have a very um, interesting uh, process to the customer. Especially you have peak times in summer and at Christmas, which is a nightmare. You have three weeks to produce, I don't know, 60% of the records. So um, this is a challenge. Um, but of course you get the money before you actually start producing something. Which can also be said as negative, negative for the capital, which is, which is the case. Yeah. So it's very nice. You do this for, for a few years, um, and then you become kind of an expert into into the retail and e I'm still trying to become one, yeah. But well, the market perception is different. Well, I, I guess a lot of people come to you now to ask for insights. Um, you then, like, have to try this
like everybody wants to go there because all the cool people are on stage, they run around, you can check them out, and uh, it's two and a half days in Berlin. Plus 40% over time, 50% this year we outperformed the DAX, 
And, and we put money ourselves into the business. And so that's also one of my sayings, put your money where your mouth is. So it's either your time or your money, you put it in your business idea or your whatever, you go to work for someone else because you believe in what they do. So, and so that, that's where, where I still believe that when you look at the, the commerce world right now, it's between 10 to 15 percent digital B2C commerce. And, and only 10 to 15 percent. Yeah, it's very, very low. So, what, so and already incumbents like former retail players are really, really struggling. So, what if this is 20, 25, 30 percent? How does it all look like? It's going to be ouch. And, and I want to be on the other side saying like, okay, look, I, I'm not saying like I told you, I said I offer a product, I think you should find a way if you're in retail to get into, into the digital or the digital side. So you have your own, build your own index, yes. which is kind of also backed up by a lot of the retail experts in, in the dark region. So you have quite a lot of, uh, um, yeah. I would say, mentors in, in that index who help you pick um, the, the stocks. So who is part of this index? Which, which are the companies you're betting on? At the moment, um, again, there was the, the situation was that like, three years ago the, the portfolio was not that, that, that broad, and over the last three years we had lots of cool IPOs. And, uh, and we try really to, to, um, to invest also in markets which are very far away, like Japan or like uh, China. We have, like, and we didn't start with Pinduoduo's and mobile. Shopping app or Macari used items in China. Seku got a big one from Alibash, which is uh, luxury segments. So there's lots of stuff happening. And I'm not saying that I'm the super guy knowing all this, but I just have this hunch that there's a trend. And I just believe in that trend. And um, and if you like to look at it, I think it's, it's, it's a smart way to, to, to be on the digital side rather than. On the, on the bricks and mortar side. And we talked before that, it's, I don't say that people will all go online, there will be stores, but I don't think that the winners are the ones who come from back, bricks and mortar background. It's going to be a Max, Max Litbox or Wobby Parkers, that people who actually have a digital DNA, thinking data, having centralized logistics, and then say, okay, let's try stores. But they run stores. In a completely different way. So the incumbents who own stores are going digital will not make it versus those that are digital only who are then going into the offline world with all these data we're talking about. I mean, I, I also um, happen to try to interview people with a podcast on my own, and uh, when you have people there, I mean, I have young people there from Sportcheck, and then when the microphone is off, is more open about the situation and the stores. So and then you just put one and one together. This is very it's a very difficult situation then, with these legacy structures. So just for everyone's interest, I could look at the capital of uh, like who are part of this index. So you have Amazon, Zalando, Zucos, and Baba, Wayfair, Asus, um, Akado, the IT shop, Nasper, Kinevik. Shore, Privé, Rakuten, Etsy, among others. So quite a few names. So my question is, are you um, going to invest into the next IPOs that are coming up? For example, West Wing, or um, have you invested in Farfetch, for example? Or do you want to? Yeah, it, we just try to pick the, 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 the market or segment leaders. We, we love our founders, teams that are running the companies. And we, we're looking at growth rate being above twenty percent at the time, and we um, we look at cash flow. So we don't look at EBIT or I don't really, I'm not interested in, in EBIT. This one I don't understand that the stock market is looking at growth companies and expecting EBIT. It's like why you cannot grow if you I mean it's either EBIT or it's growth. But I mean there are a few exceptions. A few exceptions. So that's why Bola gave away two plus shares a couple of years ago at 50 euros and I think it was 150 now. So. so your criteria to invest or to bring the stocks into the index from the lay 
Social media 
here, um, here friends of mine, they, they run the, the beast in or use the end label, they run the corner, and they are just super great at Instagram. They are top 30 uh, um, partner with Nike for all the cool props. So I just always go like, oh yeah, so, uh, you got the new offline, come on, man. So they just created this out of, out of nothing. And, and just by actually playing the Insta Instagram card so perfectly well. Um, so, I mean, and on the other hand, this is of course uh, difficult because this is open to everyone. So it's not, there's no barrier to entry actually. Uh, that you can say, yeah, I'm good at this, but then the next guy is coming uh, with this new idea. So it's, it's, it goes both ways. Um, but this is what I like about the market. Everybody's picking products now, just trying it, testing it. It's one thing. I think classical um, um, horizontal retail, difficult to get funding at the moment, so you need to be specialized. And, and I think, as I mentioned before, the um, all this stuff about logistics, city logistics, uh, a bit retail is also uh, in there. So it's, it's, everything is a bit intertwined when it comes to commerce. It's not only like DHL or UPS are the ones. I think they're going to get disrupted. Um, I still have this quote from Mr. Apple from DHL, CEO, three years ago that Amazon will not build up uh, logistics infrastructure. I just fell off my chair by the time then. I said, like, what is this guy smoking? And then you don't see like, okay, they're buying planes, they're ramping up their fleet, and, and, and you just say, what are these people actually paying for? I don't really understand. And, and so even these guys get disrupted. So, and from, from this angle, I, I would actually look at the markets, not like being the next Amazon plus or Otto, but saying what is the, the specialty need, what actually do people want? Uh, it's the same you can look at Uber. Like, why say that? Okay, it disrupt the, the, uh, the taxi market, but um, I think everybody should see now that they are actually a logistics company. So they actually have the infrastructure actually delivering, you know, like breeds. But now it's not really open. But back in time, it was like, okay, yeah, well, I mean, you can put anything in this car and uh, get you know your shirts from the dry cleaner, whatever. So. Um, this is, I think, um, something which where you know all the the, the, the segment areas are just it's flowing. Yeah, flowing. Guys, thanks a lot for joining us tonight. Thanks a lot for listening to the great story of Sven. Um, Sven, thanks a lot for joining us as well and for answering um, our questions. A little gift for you. Yeah. <laughs> thanks you you guys. I'm a year starter, I'm not really. <laughs> so it's the shirt you made with the first chocolate. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I also would like to thank WeWork for hosting us tonight. And of course, I would like to thank my team, Michelle, Dina, and uh, Rafi, for uh, setting up this entire event. And last but not least, we had great uh, food startups with us tonight. So um, we have the Fisher Manufacturer, who is very healthy snacks. Um, these are the fruits that you can see there, which you can still eat, um, very fresh and healthy. We have hand spray food, which power your brain uh, with some snacks as well. I hope you tried it. If not, please have a taste. It's really good. And we have also Swoonch, um, our startup, um, which is providing a virtual canteen for a small and medium-sized enterprises that cannot afford an on-site uh, canteen. So try their food if you're forward. I would uh, recommend you to use their service for your employees because there's nothing better than having happy teams that have uh, good lunch um, at work. And uh, thanks for joining us. I also just would like to do one little thing. We are um, calling also for team members. So if you would like to join the Startup Brian team uh, from Munich and organize these monthly events on a recurring basis, get to know very insightful entrepreneurs 